Hello everyone, I'm Michael McCoy. I'm a second year student at Texas A&M University under the study of Dr. Jacqueline Grace. I'm in the Ecology and Evolutionary Biology program and for part of my research I am working down here on the Wilder Wildlife Refuge. So my project is looking at how uh, avian community dynamics shift uh, in relation to hurricanes and other natural disturbance events. Down here at Welder, I am doing field work for two different portions of my project. First of all, I'm working with the MAPS station down here at the refuge, which is the Monitoring Avian Productivity and Survivorship. This station has been running for about the last 12 years or so, and I've been helping out with that for the last three years, and also I'm using the data going all the way back to 2007. So with those data, what I'm really looking at is how are body condition and demographics of individual birds, of passerines, songbirds, how are those changing over time in relation to uh, the drought of 2011-2012? In addition, how is that changing in relation to the after effects of Hurricane Harvey in 2017? The second part of my project that I'm actually doing field work down here at Walder for, I'm looking at doing point counts, looking at how bird populations are shifting in the years after Hurricane Harvey also looking at habitat relationships in this coastal mesquite besat shrubland down here at the refuge. I have 45 different points that I'm surveying for that part of the project and I survey each one of those three different times over the course of the breeding season uh, from about mid-May through late June early July. So I'll go ahead and just take you through a little bit about what a point count actually is. I'll do just a quick demonstration here. Traditionally the point counts are six minutes in length but we'll just do uh, you know, have a, just a couple of birds that are singing back here, and we'll run through exactly what it is that I do, um, what I do with this rangefinder here, and the type of data that I collect. So, one of the great things about point counts is that it doesn't require a whole lot of gear. The two things that I have on me right here are my binoculars and my rangefinder, and those are the two most essential pieces of gear that I need for point counts. Other than that, I need my boots. I carry a machete with me to whack through some brush when I'm hiking to and from my points. And I carry a clipboard, which I don't have on me now, but that's what I keep my data sheets on in the field. So it's nice to be able to travel lightly doing point counts, as opposed to some sort of more hands-on sampling technique where I might have to lug around a big backpack or some big duffel full of gear or something like that. It's also important that I, I walk between each of my points. I don't drive, because driving a four-wheeler or driving a car between my bird points that I do point counts at can affect bird activity and can flush birds from where they were originally. Walking between points ensures that I disturb the birds as little as possible. This is one of the data sheets that I use for my bird points. Uh, as you can see up here, this is actually a, a copy of a data sheet from another project in Colorado, but I use the same data sheet for the purposes of my own work as well. Here we have um, columns for start time for each bird point, the point number, this is point number 21 and point number 17, point number 13, and then each point is divided into six minutes. So for the minute that I first detect each individual bird in, that is where I record record that bird in this data sheet. So for example, in minute one, I'm getting the most things in minute one, and then a few more in minute two. And then minutes four, five, and six, I'm just adding maybe one more bird each time. The reason that I divide it up into minutes like this, and the reason I only record birds in the minute in which they were first detected, is because that really plays into this whole concept of detectability, where some bird species are more detectable by nature to, to me as the observer than others. Things like painted buntings that perch very conspicuously on tops of trees and are very vocal are a lot more detectable than something like a white-tipped dove, which might walk around quietly and skulk in the underbrush. And then here we have our column for species, which is where I record all my four-letter species codes. And then I have my column for distance, and then my column is called entitled how, and that's just where I write down uh, the method of which I first detected each individual bird, by song or by call or if I saw it, which would be visual in that case. And then I also have a column here for, uh, for sex, if I happen to see the bird I can write down whether it was a male or female. Again that's not super important for what I'm doing, but it's just nice to be able to collect that data anyways, just since I'm already out there and since I can. At each bird point I also do a, a brief pretty broad vegetative assessment. So I look at um, percent, uh, percent cover from overstory and midstory of woody vegetation, most of which in my study plots out here is comprised of mesquite species as well as resatch. 
And I also do ocular assessments of various different ground covers, um, such as native grasses, invasive blue stems, so I can break that up into species, uh, percent bare ground, percent litter, percent forb cover. And I do that, I do all those things uh, in a standardized method at the same spot in which I have each bird point. And then that can, kind of goes into this question of, you know, how are some of these songbirds relating to these habitat characteristics around them? So areas with thicker mesquite or thicker wesatch might have higher occupancy rates, something like painted bunting, while areas with denser ground cover might have something, you know, you might have higher densities or occupancy rates of something like bob white or white tipped out perhaps. So that's why I'm going in and doing these habitat assessments in these bird points as well. So here we are, then we're going to do a, a brief little mock point count here, just to get an idea of how I go about doing a, a proper point count. And this is a method that's pretty widely used in avian research around the world here in the US. Uh, it's a pretty traditional technique. But for the ones that I'm doing, I'm doing six minute point counts, and they are distance based. And what that means is for every individual bird that I detect during the point count, I will take this handy dandy rangefinder here and measure the distance to that individual bird to the best that I can. And I'm getting the distance to the nearest meter. So it's imperative that I am as accurate as possible with my distance. But sometimes it's not very easy since we're, most of the birds that I'm detecting are by sound and not really by sight. So from here I'm hearing like six or seven different individual birds right now. And to do the best job that I can, I'll have to take this rangefinder and measure the distance to each one of those by kind of sp spatially arranging where I think that bird is in my surroundings and being as accurate as possible when I get to actual distance to them. So in addition to that, the other data that I record are the species, of course, uh, whether the bird's a male or a female, if I can actually see it. And also if I'm detecting it by song or by call or by if I just see it, so that would be by visual. And the reason that's important is singing birds, if I detect a bird by song, singing birds indicate breeding of the bird at the site, so that just kind of is more helpful to say, yes, this bird is probably on territory, therefore it's probably going to be a breeder here, not just a, a bird that might just be passing through, or a bird that just might be flying overhead perhaps from habitat to habitat. So what we'll do now, we'll go ahead and just do a couple of mo do a mock point count here, not for the full six minutes, we'll just do for you know 20 or 30 seconds and just get a couple of different birds and get distances to those birds so we can get a real-time view of what's going on. So first of all, I'm hearing a painted bunting singing from over here. It sounds like he's coming from behind this fence line, probably in the bush a little bit to the right of that opening behind these close trees. So I'll then write down painted bunting on my data sheet. Uh, I use four-letter codes, and the four-letter codes for painted bunting is P-A-B-U. And then I detect the bird by song, and then I'll measure the distance to where I think this bird is, measuring it at 62 meters. So then I would write 62 meters down on my data sheet for that bird. And I'm also hearing a white-eyed vireo over there from the same area. It sounds like he's coming from a little bit lower in the canopy, and maybe from the brush a little bit closer to us in the painted bunting. And I'll take the rangefinder again and shoot to where I think this vireo is coming from, and I'm getting 59 meters. And then I'd write 59 meters down for that. I'm getting another white eyed vireo now from over here. And he's coming from a little bit further back in the brush. In this case, it's, it's difficult to get an accurate distance to it. But what I'll do is I'll shoot the rangefinder to as far back as I can. That's 43 meters. I think about where the bird actually is, and I say, okay, it sounds about 30 meters behind the farthest point that I can see. So then I would just add 30 meters to that 43 meters. Therefore writing down 73 meters on my data sheet for that bird. Maybe not the perfect way to go about it, but it's the best that we can do given the circumstances. And the reason that I am being so precise with these distances is because that allows me to go in and build the most robust occupancy models for these birds once I have all my data collected. Uh, as opposed to if I just had, you know, use distance bands, 0 to 25 or 25 to 50 meters, or if I didn't do distances at all, in that case, you know, the questions that I can answer, the, the models that I can build with those data might not be as specific or as accurate as the ones that I can use with the way that I'm doing it here. Thanks for being here with me today, and thanks 
to the Baldur Wildlife Foundation for the financial and logistical support that they provide for my research out here. Feel free to reach out to me at my contact info listed below if you have any questions.